In this episode, we're going to give you a checklist for preparing to buy in 2022. At the end of 2021, we started seeing negative headlines around property and you could be forgiven for thinking, great, I'll wait until prices fall before I buy. Now, is that really a good idea? Today, Veronica is interviewing myself and our special guest, Jared McCabe in Melbourne. Now, hold on to your hats while we discuss what to expect in the three biggest markets in Australia. We're going to give you practical tips for getting yourself ready to buy in 2022. Welcome to your first home buyer guide, the podcast for first home buyers who want to get it right. I'm Megan and that was Veronica. We're both buyers agents and probably old enough to be your mums. But that's a good thing because between us, we've got over 40 years experience and we are going to share with you bucket loads of stories about avoidable mistakes. Together, we're going to make sure that you get unbiased and real information that you can rely on so you can get where you want to be without missing a step. Now, we've got loads of great tips for you in this episode. And if you'd like more useful tools, head over to the website, homebuyeracademy.com.au. There you'll find free checklists that you can download, a free mini course on how to price a property and our where to buy workshop for only $39. Priceless stuff, really. Bargain. But before we get into the interesting stuff in this week's episode, here's the boring bit, the disclaimer. You of course know that nothing in this podcast is to be taken as personal advice. We always recommend getting the advice of an expert in their field of expertise. Now we've done our very best to ensure that the content is correct at the time of recording, but things change. So check with the relevant government authority or your advisors to get the most up-to-date information. Hi, Veronica. Hi, Megan. Good to see you both. Yeah, good to see you too. My goodness, it's been a long time since we've been in the same place. Yeah, absolutely. (laughs) In fact, I think that was 2019, wasn't it? The middle of which, yes. So, Jared, actually, we were in uh, Melbourne, weren't we, Veronica? We were catching up with Jared down there. We were doing a bit of business, recording some videos. Yeah, yeah. Well, memories. <laughs> <laughs> Jared, Bring I'm going to kick off with you first. <laughs> How has the Melbourne property market fared coming out of its sixth lockdown? For we, we came out of our lockdown. We probably had it a bit more severe in terms of impact on property specifically than what you did in Sydney, uh, just in the fact that we couldn't conduct one-on-one inspections at all during uh, during August and the majority of September. And then once things started to come out, we were able to do the one-on-one inspections and it's gradually progressed to being back to relative normality at the moment. The first probably four weeks after that um, that first easing of restrictions to one-on-one inspections was manic. It just, it went berserk. It was a, it went further than what it was doing the first half of the year, which was very, very strong. Um, but the first four weeks was, was fairly crazy and there was some a lot of uh extreme prices being paid there was a lot of fear of missing out i think there'd been a lot of buyers that had missed out three or four times and were just adamant they were going to buy the first thing that they came across um but after that four week period it's, it's really started to to settle down a bit but similar to what you just said the uh the clearance rate has come back but that's not unusual uh at this time of year and that leads into something that's quite interesting. We'll get to Brisbane in a minute, but certainly in Sydney, and I and I suspect Melbourne is quite similar, there's a seasonality. So what typically happens in Sydney is spring brings a lot of new stock onto the mm. market and buyers are quite often, particularly in a hot market, they're exhausted. And so they are like going, oh, my God, actually it's great to see the pressure eased. Mm. And instead of taking advantage of that, quite often what they do is say, you know what, I'm just going to go and do other things and I'll wait till Mm. next year before I buy. Um, And that is a typical spring into Christmas market in Sydney. Would you say you're seeing similar things in Melbourne? Yeah, exactly. So the um, we've missed out on a month and a half, basically, of transactions in August and September. So there was a lot of buy- um, vendors, sorry, who were ready to go at that stage and were planning to sell in the early part of the spring market uh, and didn't get the opportunity to because they weren't prepared to uh, sell in a market where buyers couldn't uh, inspect their properties. So they held back and held back, uh, and that's what's increased the supply 
uh, above what it would normally be at this time of year. But you do see this on a very regular basis that the uh, the supply builds and builds, people buy and then need to sell. So there's a lot of property coming on the market. But it also gets to, we find that after Melbourne Cup, sort of mid-November into towards late November, that those that have missed out um, start to lose. You, you can find that it either goes one of two ways. If it's a really strong market that's probably starting, so like 2019 where we really built through the uh, the spring market right up to Christmas and it continued a really strong clearance rate right through to um, the last week, last Saturday prior to Christmas Day, and it was a really strong build. Whereas um, other years you'll find that it, once you get that other side of the Melbourne Cup long weekend, it really starts to plateau and then starts to drop off and, and buyers lose focus. They're uh, focusing on Christmas, family, going on holidays and uh, and decide that we'll look at uh, buying property again in the new year, take stock, talk, talk to family and friends and, and reconsider our options. And that's probably been exacerbated even further this year, given that um, a lot of Victorians, Melbournians particularly, haven't been able to get out at all. And so they're, uh, they're looking to really make the most of, of this summer period. And so property is becoming uh, a second option and, and will be reviewed again in the new year. We've had an enormous amount of auctions in Sydney and I know you've had huge volumes in Melbourne as well. What, mm. How are the clearance rates in Melbourne uh, as you head into the end of the year? Again, as you said, it was, it, we're pretty similar to Sydney, I think. I mean, we've um, prior to this year, um, probably the biggest weekend in Victoria was about 18 or 1900 auctions. Um, and it Whoa. was usually on that last last oct- last Saturday of October is usually the really big one because it's the a clear run from the AFL grand final um, before the spring carnival kicks in. Sports very important, Veronica. Trying to very to navigate all time that. frames here that are very sport oriented. <laughs> um, so you, when does the ballet really- come into this? Sorry. When does the ballet come into this? It doesn't seem to impact the auction market. <laughs> <laughs> but it, and tennis um, is in January when nothing's yeah. happening anyway. Nothing's so, happening. Yeah. so that's that's done deliberately too. So no, but you get a clear run there. And so that's quite often the last Saturday or last weekend in October is quite often the biggest weekend of the year. But this year we've seen um, auction numbers the last two weeks and I think the next two weeks as well, maybe not the 18th. So I think there was a, it was at least three to four weeks well, there's been in excess of 2,000 auctions every weekend, um, wow. which is – and then to see that the clearance rate initially did hold up at around 80%. It's now dropped back into the 70s, and I think on the weekend it dropped below 70% into the high 60s. So, But I, I don't know if you could expect anything else when you get that flood of, of, um, of supply. It's just, and, and when you're moving mm. into a Christmas period where people do tend to change focus, it's absolutely to be expected. Yeah. Megan, Brisbane isn't what you call an auction city, you know, like Sydney and Melbourne are, but if you can't use clearance rates as a gauge of what the market's doing, how do you typically measure the heat or otherwise in the market? It's really interesting because traditionally Brisbane's had about 10% or less of properties that go to auction, most are uh, sold through private treaty. And the clearance rates generally sit between about 53 and 56%. So that's, you know, I'm stra- extrapolating over a long period of time. But at the moment, we're sitting at about 73%. And that's extraordinarily oh. high for, mm. for Brisbane. Now, that's come off a little bit from being in the 80s. And, and one of the really interesting things is that, you know, we've got, we've got a whole lot of things all happening at the same time. We've got seasonality, which Jared really, you know, clarified in Melbourne what happens with seasonality down there. Here, seasonality really only came into its own in the last four or five years with a spring selling season, which was largely driven by the media um, Mm. telling everybody up here that there is spring. We don't even know there's spring up here. We go from winter to (laughs) summer and it's about a two-week transition. Um, But, you know, now we have a spring selling season. Uh, So we have a seasonality factor, which is a bit more property coming on in in spring. Um, We have a, a market cycle happening, which is there is a lot of buyers demand and that buyer demand isn't petering off just 
yet, although we're starting to see green shoots of that. So we've had a lot of buyer demand, which means we're in a really strong upward cycle like most of the country. Um, and, and that's really interesting because what that's doing is actually forcing agents to make a decision as to whether they're going to go down the traditional private treaty route, which is, you know, to, to put people in competition, present offers to owners and, and essentially say to them, put your best and final offer forward and often those offers have conditions. Now agents are, are saying to owners, look, we can run a really short campaign here, maybe a two-week or a 10-day auction campaign and put these people in, in competition with each other. So the traditional auction campaign of four or five weeks, four weeks of open houses and auction on the fifth week is being shortened in Brisbane. And we have this new kind of phenomenon of, of, of um, properties being put to a short auction campaign which is kind of good because it opens up the transparency of the negotiation with the buyers. But it's it's hard because if you haven't got all your ducks lined up and, you know, as Veronica, you know, disclosure is very limited in Queensland. So it's a very short period of time to, to get everything done. So we've got, we've got, you know, as I say, seasonality is happening. Um, we've got market cycle that's happening. We've got holidays coming up and most people leave Brisbane during the holidays because they, they want to drive that one hour to get to the coastal um, areas and so there's an exodus of of people from Brisbane during the holiday period so the private schools have already gone on holidays we're 7th of December when we're recording this and and they won't go back to um, school until the last week of January so there's a large period of time where Brisbaneites aren't here but now we've got the X factor, which is the COVID factor, which we have, the borders have just been announced to be reopened largely um, to most people from the 14th, the morning of the 1am on Monday, the 13th of, of December. So people who were originally preparing to come here in on the 17th of December are now maybe getting in into the state a little bit earlier. So this X factor of people, this pressure of people who are coming into the state um, is actually going to change the seasonality and the cycle. So we've got this X factor effect on, on two things, well, three things really, that we normally see during this part of, part of the year, which is seasonality, holidays and, and their market cycle. So, so it you- is, it's, it's really an unusual time in the Brisbane property market. Well, I think clearance rates uh, in the 80s and 70s even is unusual. Um, completely, <laughs> just completely, like, yep. Um, but also, so you're suggesting that a lot of these people that are coming up to visit family or have holidays or whatever, that they're actually coming up with an intention to buy? Mm, there's a reloc- there's, there's a massive relocation um, trend coming into Queensland at the moment. And we've seen that in the data, but we're going to see it more now that the, the borders are open. We've got people who are coming back to Queensland who are you know, Brisbane or Queensland-based people who have lived interstate and are going to move back here. We've seen um, a large uh, response from investors to the marketplace saying, I can get a really good price for my property at the moment, therefore I'm going to divest. They're selling really well and, and making good money, which was part maybe part of their plan, maybe part, maybe it brought their plan forward. Um, but there's, there's a, a decrease in the number of investment properties available for rent at the moment, which is putting um, upward pressure on rental prices. Uh, and then we've got the, the influx of um, international people and interstate people who are looking to relocate to Brisbane. So the net migration into Queensland and particularly southeast Queensland ha- is the strongest that it's been since um, 2002, which is when we saw our last rather amazing boom um, in prices. Um, And I don't use the word lightly. I don't like the word boom, but there's no other way to describe what prices are doing at the moment other than, um, you know, every now and then we look at each other in our office and say it's sold for what? Uh, with, 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 uh, you know, shock and awe of, of, of what prices are doing and how quickly things are moving. What's so interesting is that particularly in Sydney and Melbourne, we've had an exodus of people leaving both cities mm. um, to the regions and also north to, to Bruce Vegas. <laughs> um, and yet our prices have been rising. Mm. Uh, and I know Melbourne hasn't been quite as strong as Sydney, but and I'm talking generally about Sydney market. Mm. I know you've got to be careful here because there's micro markets within markets, et cetera. However, when you see Sydney prices have gone up roughly about 30% um, over a year and, and people have been leaving, Melbourne hasn't got quite that much. What's the Melbourne median price done in the last year, Jared? It'd be close to twenty percent, I'd say. 
maybe a bit more. Which is still decent, right? Let's mm. face it. Mm. Not, yeah, you know, still very gonna, strong. Yeah, you're not going to quibble over that. No. And then, you, and you look at and you look at Brisbane and where the population is moving towards. Certainly, Australians are certainly moving there, and that's um, and we'll be seeing prices rise. So the sustainability of that boom, as you call it, um, it, it advised terms. Well, <laughs> Megan, you know, I, I call it upward pressure. Honestly, that's that's yeah. the term that I generally use. There's an extraordinary amount of upward pressure on prices at the moment because the demand is not um, flagging and the supply is quite good. We have more transactions that we have than we have ever had since 1996. I think I, I did some mm-hmm. data on that. Um, so the transactions are there, but the demand is far outweighing the supply from that point of view. So it's not like there's not enough listings. There's just way too many people looking for those yeah. properties. But it's not local demand. You've got, you've got migration from other states there. And I'm curious, though, just sort of before we move into, I guess, what to expect for next year in, in all three areas, but I'm curious, back in 2002, you said that last boom. How long would you say that lasted for? Uh, it went through to about the end of 2003 to start of 2004. So there was a sustained period of of, 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 of quite strong growth over that period of time. Um, and it was a period of time where actually at the time that it started, I was a selling agent. So I was um, riding that, wow, I can't believe they just got that price sort of thing. And then at the end of or sort of towards the end of it, I went into buyer's agency, which is, you know, where you you're trying to work hard to get a really decent price for you know buy at a really decent price for people, um, and 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 it was a it was a period of time where we had that high net migration at the same time, but we actually didn't have an X factor apart from, uh, and this is largely in the past what's driven price growth in Brisbane. It was the biggest price differential between Sydney and Melbourne at the time than we'd seen in a really long time. And Brisbane had just come out of quite a a stagnant period of almost, you know, I think there was negative growth through the 90s and it was very difficult to sell properties and it could take 18 months to sell properties in the 90s in Brisbane. Uh, So it it sort of came off a really, really, really low base. Um, And and then this, this large a factor of net migration and the affordability gap but there was a lot of investor activity at that point in time so in the that sort of two early 2000s period there was a huge amount of interstate investment that was happening in Brisbane not just migration and a, a principal um, place of uh, residence purchases happening we're not seeing that now and I think the thing that I I, I guess I want to you know, table with the group today is I think there's going to be a huge, huge amount of pressure on um, people who are renting properties. There, there, there has been an, a mass. I, I was talking to the CEO of one of the biggest uh, franchises in Australia. Um, sorry, the Queensland CEO of one of the biggest franchises in Australia the other day, and 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 I said to him, we've lost about twenty three percent of our rent roll, which is a small rent roll. We're a small business, property pursuit, and he said, yeah, we're we're coming up to twenty five percent of our rent roll has been sold in Queensland. So that's investors taking advantage of the market and selling their properties. We are not seeing investors in the marketplace in in Brisbane and Greater Queensland at the moment replacing that stock for renters of properties. Mm. And I think that's the biggest concern that I have for the market in in Queensland and Jared would be interested in Veronica yourself and what you're seeing investors doing because we're normally about a 50-50 split in buyers agency of owner occupiers and investors and we're probably sitting at about 20% investors at the moment. So we're not replenishing the stock that's being sold out of the market at the moment. What I want to talk to you guys as to what we could expect moving into 2022, because if that's typical of a spring market in Sydney, where we get loads of stock, buyers start getting bored, the clearance rates start falling, um, we get to the end of the year, we limp to the end of the year, where we just sort of there might be a few listings left over, you know, by Christmas, and then nothing happens for a couple of weeks because everything shuts. And we're an auction area, so therefore, or an auction city, so therefore any area that's predominantly auctions, you're not going to see a lot of new listings coming on until they can run a full auction campaign. And then you've got Australia Day that sort of gets in the way of that at the end of end of January. So you're really not going to see much in the way of stock come on until very end of January into February, which is one of the reasons why clearance rates typically have been highest in February because that's when there's the lowest amount of stock. And then you've got all these buyers 
that have re-entered the market or entered the market because they've had time to think and a holiday and maybe get divorced over, <laughs> maybe lose it, you know, <laughs> maybe split up. All the life changes that happens when you have a bit of time to have a breather and another and a couple of cold bevies. And, um, you know, and so that's that's a sort of a typical entry into into a Sydney property market in a, in what we call a normal market. Is that the sort of thing that you would anticipate in in Melbourne, Jared? Yeah, and where again you you're speaking Melbourne's language there, Veronica. It's the same sort of thing. We tend to find that um, Australia Day is quite often the trigger for things to start off again. It's probably started a little bit earlier um, the last couple of years, but usually the bulk of the market starts to open up. People are coming back from holidays. The year really starts in February with school, that type of thing as well. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, and you do get that clear run. So we have Labor Day, which next year is the second weekend of March. So you typically find that if you start just after Australia Day, you'll get three, there'll be three weekends before Labor Day. There'll be the, the 19th of Feb, 26th of Feb, and then the 5th of March will be the, the three main weekends. And then um, we'll have Labor Day and then there'll be a, a bit of an interruption then and we'll get another clear run because Easter's, I think, about the <laughs> second weekend of April next year. So there's usually a, clear, a reasonably clear run for, for a few weeks there as well. But um, then you get Anzac Day, and Anzac Day next year uh, creates a long weekend because it's a Monday. So um, there's the first four months of the year, there's a lot of interruptions. And it's interesting, I mean, it's probably getting off topic a little bit, but if you sit back and look at the whole calendar year, there's quite often not much more than a six to eight week period where you don't get an interruption from something, whether it's a public Mm. holiday, whether it's school holidays, um, there's always something that starts to throw the mark or just makes the market stall for a week or two and then kick again. So it'll be interesting to see how it opens up next year. But we, I mean, with our, we do just do a bit of vendor advisory work and that's probably making up a, a fair bit more of our business mm. in recent years as well. And we quite regularly advise clients that um, selling in February, March is a, is a great time because of that pent up demand that you spoke about. And mm. people do go away and think about things and talk to friends and family over yes. the break. Uh, and really make some some significant decisions. And you combine that with the fact that there's been uh, any number of buyers who've missed out prior to Christmas and just got sick of the market and decided to take stock. And you combine all that, it's not unusual to see a strong market open in the new year. And the other thing that we probably take take notice of is how do the, um, the peninsulas perform during January? So the Mornington Peninsula and the Bellarine Peninsula. So Portsea, Sorrento, Blair Gowrie, mm-hmm. Rye, um, and then over the other side at um, Bowen Heads and Queenscliff, Point Lonsdale, Lawn and Torquay, and see what the market's doing there. You regularly see if the market is strong on those peninsulas over the break. It typically means that Melbourne will open quite well. Mm-hmm. Not yeah. always in reverse, though. You don't always, just because it's poor or not strong down on the peninsulas, doesn't mean that it won't be strong in Melbourne. It could still be. But if it is if it is positive, it's quite often pretty strong in Melbourne too. So they're your holiday the same, markets, a little bit like that's the Sunshine right. Coast and Gold Yeah, that's Coast exactly right, mate. Yeah. 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 I was wondering if you're going to say the same thing in, in – uh, what about Gold Coast? The sunny coast, yes. The Gold Coast, is that the same thing or is that a, yeah, a, a beast the, of its the, own? The demand there is so strong at the moment that the uh, yeah the prices are racing fairly steadily upwards and um, it's, it's, it's very hard – do you know what I found really fascinating? Sorry, Jared was listening to you talk about the year in auction chunks. It, you know, yeah. it's, it, obviously, <laughs> that's how a, a selling agent and you know a buyer's agent in those markets who knows those mm. markets really well has to think. We don't have to really think like that up here necessarily, mm. except it is becoming more and more prevalent. So thank you. You just gave me an awesome piece of gold today. <laughs> to and we, we look at that As we change to an auction then, market in Brisbane. Yeah, it's amazing. You, you look at it and you look at the public holidays and when they sit, mm. there's Australia Day, there's Labor Day, there's Easter, there's Queen's Birthday. There's usually a gap in the middle of the year, but not a lot yep. happens winter-wise in Melbourne because of the cold weather. So mm-hmm. it does go dormant during sort of July, August, and then things open up and you'll have a chuckle again, but the grand final is a big thing at the end of <laughs> September. So, and that, that's now a long weekend. <laughs> then you got there was the a Melbourne public Cup, holiday put there, and then you've yep, got Melbourne Cup yep, and then you've got yep, Christmas. Yep. So it really is amazing that, that there are, it, it, if you look at it, it's probably six to eight weeks is the best clear run that you'll get. Look at that. Okay, so there's a piece of gold from Jared McKay from Wakeland Property Advisory in Melbourne for sellers listening to this podcast about how (laughs) to plan your auction campaign when, when to go to market. 
But in the meantime, <laughs> here we are talking about what's happening next year. Um, Veronica, the Sunshine Coast and the Gold Coast have got extraordinarily strong demand. They are the more um, volatile markets in, in Brisbane. So if you think about, and, you know, I always use the terminology, Brisbane's usually like the Clydesdale. It, it's, you know, pretty reliable. It plods along. When things slow, they slow. They don't necessarily drop. So what typically happens in the new year in Brisbane, in the Brisbane market? Um, it's fairly you sleepy know, here. You're not, uh, <laughs> well, you don't have those sort of auction, <laughs> you don't have those auction um, cycles that, that Jared and I are familiar mm. with. And, yeah. um, but you said that most Bris Vegans, sorry, Bris, what do you call you? Calls? <laughs> From Bris, Bris um, Vegas. Brisbaneites. Yeah. Brisbaneites. Bris Vegas. Yeah. <laughs> So you said that most Bris Vegans will evacuate the city because it's bloody hot and there's no coast. Um. Yeah, they, t- they tend to go to the coast. So you'll find yeah. half of Brisbane in Noosa and the other half in- on the Gold Coast. <laughs> I-, I jest. But um, there is a lot, you know, there, there, there is. that People go outside of Brisbane generally for the school ho- holiday period, whether they stay through until Christmas and then they go or whatever. But the, the roads are really quiet. It's, it's quite quiet in the city. Um, and you'll find most people on the coast. Uh, so, so that's great, you know, this year with tourism. We're really encouraging tourism within Queensland and people staying around. That, that's fabulous. But what it means for the property market is um, it is a time where, well, there's two things happening. One, it's quieter, so there aren't many new listings, but most agents know what are going to come on, what property is going to come on in January, and they're aiming those properties to come on the market late January. So around that, you know, post-Australia Day when people are back at school, maybe the week before they'll come on the market. Most agents know about that. So it actually creates good buying opportunities during this period of time where people have gone, I'm tired, I'm done, I'm out of here, I can't think about it anymore, I need to plan my Christmas lunch. I need to actually have some time with my family. I just can't think about buying a property anymore. They're exhausted. There are buyers who are absolutely exhausted. They've made three, four, six, eight offers on properties, been to four or five auctions. They're exhausted at the moment and they just want some downtime. But there are properties there. The agents know about them and most of them are, um, are working through to a large degree. You know, you could pick up the phone to them and say, what have you got coming up and and you'll find out about them. So there there are opportunities out there during this period, but there's a lot less pressure on the immediacy of of getting in, making an offer and buying. So it sounds like that's a commonality across all three markets Mm. um, that we can expect less stock. We can expect fresh buy uh, in in the short term. Can you hear that? There's a big thunderstorm here in uh, in Sydney going thunder? off. Wow. Yeah, that was it's ex- thunder that was spectacular. in the middle of the, world, the afternoon, yeah. Um, I tell you what, your London background is looking beautiful and sunny though. <laughs> I know. It's a beautiful London background I've got. I just thought I'm trying to channel one day. We'll be back out there again. We're back um, there travelling. So, yeah, so we basically uh, the commonality is that what we've got is is – you know, low stock throughout January. You've got potential for new buyers to come into the mar- into each market, really, mm-hmm. but potentially more local buyers entering the market in Sydney and Melbourne than in Brisbane. Brisbane, you've got some of our evacuees as well. Not the evacuees, so but I- honestly, Veronica, at the moment, about 60% of our buyers within the business are um, upgraders, local upgraders. Right, so okay. So it's really very- strong demand locally as well. That local. Local pressure. Mm. So, okay, so we've got local pressure then from all, from all mm. in all areas. But also because my uh, involvement with investors certainly has dropped off over the last few years as well. Um, and and despite the fact that investor lending has upticked, um, we're not yet seeing a huge amount. Of, we have got a few more investor clients on uh, in the last, say, month of the year, but that we haven't seen a huge uptick, certainly not that noticeable. Mm. And of course, if investors drew into the market in any force, that's going to that's going to actually have quite a shift. You know, if we think we've had a tough time <laughs> trying to buy in these conditions, and, and a lot of investors come in, that's going to up the ante a little bit. Mm. But you know, so despite all these headlines, you know, when Commonwealth Bank coming out sort of saying there's going to be what a thirteen percent price fall in twenty twenty two, all that sort of palaver. Mm. 
what are you sensing on the ground? I mean, let's start with you, Jared. What are you sensing as as we move into 2022? What do you what what is your feel? Because I, you know, we're all we all get a sense, don't we? I mean, we're dealing with this day in day out, so you do get a sense of what's happening. How how have you sensed the sort of slowdown, if you like, at the end of the year? And and do you feel that that's going to continue into 2022, or do you think strap yourselves in, kids? We're still on the roller coaster. I think there'll be a. I think we're finding a level in Melbourne now. I think it's starting to to find its position. I don't think we'll see clearance rates keep dropping. I wouldn't be surprised to see them sort of hover around high sixties, early seventies, that sort of level. I don't necessarily expect it to get back up to eighty percent or so, but um, I wouldn't be surprised to see it get back into the seventies for a period of time, potentially up to say Easter, and then start to to um, recalibrate and, and get itself back around that sort of level. So I think there'll be good, there'll still be good competition around, for t- particularly for the for the good quality properties and the first during the first quarter of the year. Um, but I'm not expecting to see what we saw last year, um, where it's where it's been uh, where it was going from strength to strength week after week. Um, I think we've we'll still get some growth next year, but I don't think it'll be what what this year's been. Mm. Megan, oh, it's really interesting. So, I, I think I think the thing that we keep an eye on, obviously, is is buyer inquiry because that's one of the drivers. And then you have mm. look at supply, what's coming on that you know the basics. Um, but we, we we have got a lot of people who are saying I'm just going to sit on it until next year. So mm. I think there is a little bit of pent up. Um, demand that is is going to hit next year, but when you know in these in our inner city areas, and we're talking about we and Jared, good point you made. It's quality properties. We're not talking about B and C grade locations. Your main roads flood affected on train lines. You know, we're we're not talking about those properties necessarily. I guess when we talk about you know a, a, a general demand and increase, but um, the 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 thing that I find really interesting about Brisbane is that. It doesn't seem there are not there are no indications that I've seen in other market cycles as of the slowing of buyer interest in, across all sectors apart from investors. So the investors are the only sector that I'm seeing a slowing in. So we're seeing um, that strong demand still coming from owner occupiers, uh, sorry, first time buyers from upgraders locally, from interstate, and from expats repatriating. So we've got really strong. Um, pressure coming from all of those markets but when we talk about you know that that Brisbane area as opposed to the greater Brisbane area there isn't a huge amount of increase in supply that can happen there so there are only a small number of of you know maybe splitter block subdivisions that could increase you know a few properties within some of these inner city areas so a bit like Sydney where there's that pressure on the scarcity of the land you, you can't unless you keep going further out and further out and further out, and we're talking greater Brisbane then, not Brisbane City, um, there's just nowhere for people to go except to pay more money. And that's the really interesting thing that people are looking at is if I want to be in these areas, I can't do anything except pay more money for the property and the area that I want to be in. And that's the compromise that people are talking about. You know, Veronica, we talk about in your first time by a guide, we talk about the compromises across three key areas, which is position, property and price. And what people are compromising on most at the moment is price. And they're paying more than they expected to pay in order to get what they expected before or making some compromises, but still paying more money um, because they want to be in the areas and in the properties in the A-grade locations particularly school catchments. So school catchments is a really big driver in Brisbane um, for public schools at the primary level. And then, you know, they can go on to any, um, sorry, public schools at at the primary level and then uh, private schools at the high school level. Mm. So I'm not seeing any change in that behaviour so far or any change in the level of inquiry. I'm just seeing a bit of exhaustion at the moment and I think that we're going to see that again reinvigorate through January um, and and into 2022. How far? I don't crystal ball, never have, will not, will not put a prediction out there, but I know buyer behaviour and that's the buyer behaviour I'm seeing at the moment. Yeah, I mean, look, observing similar things, to be honest, and and it's normal 
when the market does slow a little bit, when choice comes into the marketplace, that buyers then can get picky again. Because let's mm. face it, they lose all their pickiness when there's no choice and when there's prices are rising and they feel that intense FOMO. But then as soon as they think, oh, I've got choice now, I don't have to buy on a main road anymore, um, they won't buy on that main road. Mm-hmm. So I think that to me is just normal behaviour. So I think in order to prepare, I just sort of put down a couple of notes here, which um, I'll sort of put them out there and you guys can add to it. But one of the things that a lot of people will ask me, it's like, well, when's the right time to buy? You know, you're trying to tie in the market because I want to buy on the down and sell on the up. And, and you know, I think you and we, or we, all three of us know that that is a bit of folly because I think we're all on the same page and we say, look, really the right time is when you're ready um, and when you found the right property. So <laughs> because plenty of people are ready and they buy the wrong property mm. or pe- plenty of people um, are ready and don't buy uh, because they're waiting for the market to turn around and they're not in control of the market. So I think the right time to buy, and, and it sounds, of course, self-interested, the buyer's agent says, oh, the right time to buy is when you're ready. Um, of course. However, and I know that Stuart in particular, uh, sorry, um, Jared, in particular, you work do a lot of work with Stuart Weems and he's yeah. a lot of evidence around this because he's a very evidence-based financial planner. You know, that the, you buy the right asset. It doesn't sort of matter the time when you buy it. It's, it's buying for the long term. Mm. Any other hints for people preparing for 2022, Jared, Megan? Oh, we focus, I mean, as you guys do as well, asset selection is absolute key. Mm. So there's no point in going, uh, going on and focusing too much on um, buying at the right time because if you buy the wrong property at the right time, it's still going to be the wrong property when you come mm. to sell it. Mm. So get your asset selection right first and foremost. doesn't matter whether it's for an investment or whether it's for your home. It needs to meet the requirements and then worry about buying um, at the best price you possibly can. So uh, preparation is always key. And I think if you're going to hit the ground running in the new year and, and whether it's to to catch your breath and, and start again or whether it's starting for the first time, just make sure you've got everything ready to go so that if the right property comes up, whether it's private sale, whether it's an auction, um, you're in a strong position to uh, engage as soon as, uh, as soon as it hits the market. I had a couple of notes here, Jared. I think you just said everything that was in my notes. <laughs> Literally, the next thing was hit the ground running, and the next one was to how to get ready. So, I mean, I being just add to that. Game, sorry, yeah. can, I, can I add to that? Because I think you know, um, there's there's two key questions that we you know read in uh, investor forums and first time buyer forums and so forth, and and we get asked a lot, and that is you know where to buy and. Uh, which is not an answer that anyone should give you apart from working through the process <laughs> itself. But the other thing is um, the advice that I see given, which is it doesn't matter what you buy, just get into the market. And oh, I think yeah. that it's a really mm. important one that we want to dispel because it does matter. It does matter. It's not about when we talk about the best time to buy is when you're financially able, ready, and you understand what you're buying and why you're buying it. Once you've got those sort of key things in place and you understand financially your position and and your serviceability and all those sorts of really important preparation things, it isn't just about buying anything. And, Jared, you hit the nail on the head by saying it is about the right asset selection because if you get it wrong in a rapidly rising market or a peaking market, then it's going to hurt an awful lot for a very long time until you get another rapidly rising market or peaking market. And that's where you have to time your exit because you have mm-hmm. nothing you have nothing but the market that will help you overcome poor asset selection. And, and that's such a key, I think, that we, we bang on and bang on and bang on and bang on about getting the property right. It's not about when you buy, it's actually about buying the right thing. Primary example of that, Megan, we've just helped a client who bought a property themselves 10 years ago um, off the plan apartment, bought it for, I think it was about 550000 and we've uh, just helped them sell it um, and got it, sold it for 425000 In a peaking Ouch. market, in a rising 10 market. In 10, 10 years they've held that for. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so if someone says to you, it doesn't matter what you buy, just get in, um, there's an example of it does matter. Excellent example. Yeah. I think we need to write a book about that, but nobody will read it because they go, oh, you're just too negative. <laughs> um, <laughs> so I think hitting Reality the ground hurts. running is, <laughs> it does. Hitting hitting the ground running, I think is really important. So then you are able to take advantage of the right opportunity when you, when you come across it. Um, and 
being clear on what it is that is a good asset and what you need is really important so that you don't try to jump at anything. And I think that that's a really, it's a real danger because when you're ready as well, you feel like you've got, you got um, money burning a hole in your pocket. And also if you haven't learned what's the difference between A, B and C grade property, you know, we've got a Your First Home Buyer Guide episode on that. Um, just have to go over to that podcast and look it up because I can't remember the number off the top of my head. But how to get ready. Um, I've got three things here and you guys can add to them. Um, the first one is set a proper limit as in your, bod- your purchasing limit, your purchasing budget, not what you think you should pay or hope you should have to pay, but what you A, can afford and B, what you need to pay to get what you want in whatever area you're looking in. Um, Because a lot of people do, particularly when they're starting off their property search, they'll actually set their limit at what they think they should Mm. have to pay. And however long it takes them to come to grips with what's really in the market and what really they need is basically lost opportunity, particularly if it's a rising market. So, to be very educate yourself as to what the possibilities are to of your search so and what you actually need to pay and then work out what you can afford um don't go in there just going with what you want to pay <laughs> um the number two is be pre-approved i mean or have a really clear understanding of exactly what your borrowing power is because and can people- i clarify pre-approval is yeah. not doing a calculator online there was an example of a property no. in queensland where someone had jumped a doctor had jumped online done oh i can afford that yep that's fine made an unconditional offer could not settle on the property because there was a whole lot of stuff in a in a, an online calculator that they don't ask you and you don't have to put in there that the bank really 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 wants to know so it's not pre-approval is not an online calculator it's formal with the bank or a broker did that happen in, in Brisbane because I read one a doctor in Melbourne did the was same it Melbourne thing. was it oh okay so it's same might same be. so yeah. you know lost three hundred twenty thousand dollars anyway. worth of deposit yeah, you know, like God, you you know, you should be educated enough to anyway. Um, but so if doctors can do it. Anyone digress, can make but- a mistake. Yeah. <laughs> um, and the third thing is where to buy. You know, save time by looking in the right location. I mean, Megan, you and I put together two workshops: one for investors and one for owner occupiers on where to buy. Because everyone asks the question, and you'll get a hundred different answers from a hundred different people, and nearly all of them are wrong. Well, so they're, they're, um, they're from other per- people's perspective, and I think that's yes. the thing that you know we want to point out is when someone answers the question where to buy, they're giving you the answer from their perspective, not from yours. So you have to, you have to understand your own perspective and your own goals and your own. Um, you know, what, you're, what you're trying to achieve to work through a process to work out where to buy. Absolutely. So, but people do spend a lot of time looking in the wrong location and really wasting time. We say ping pong all over the place, you know, <laughs> trying to chase the market. So being ready really means being prepared in those areas. Anything you'd like to add, Jared? Um, I was just going to say, you mentioned before, obviously, the hit the ground running and, and making sure that you're ready to go. Um, you don't want to jump in too quickly, but I'm sure both of you have had the same experience whereby uh, you've presented a, a really good option to a client, whether it's an investment or a home, and um, it's been very early in the search process mm-hmm. and the response has been, I don't want to buy it. It's the first one I've seen. I'll wait and see. And how often then it, it then comes back to that everything gets compared back to that property. That's so the benchmark. if you're... Mm-hmm. If, you're, if it, you've got yourself organised, you're ready to go and the right property is the first property, don't be afraid to purchase it. Yeah. Yeah. yeah and back advice. to that, what you said earlier about being prepared. If you're prepared and you've done sort of all putting the hard yards, doing your research, getting everything lined up beforehand, you're going to be in a better position to recognise that. So mm. thank you so much for joining us, um, both of you. This has been a great sort of overview of us the the year that was or the end of the year that was <laughs> looking ahead into 2022, you know, try to give you some some understanding of the bigger picture of what these markets, um, how they perform and, and the buyer dyna- or the dynamics underneath and what's what's important in different markets. And then to be ready to go if you want to buy into 2022, what you need to do to be prepared. So uh, thanks, guys. In this episode, we've covered a very small part of our 10-step online course for first-time buyers. If you would like to learn more about the process and how to buy without making a mistake, then head over to our website, www.homebuyeracademy.com.au. 
Don't forget to subscribe to the podcast so you won't miss an episode. And if you like what you've heard today, please give us an iTunes review. Five stars would be wonderful. It will help others find us as well. Thank you for joining us. We hope you found this really useful. And if you have, please share the love with others who you know are in the same boat. We'll be back next week with some more priceless stuff.